Welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel, and um, I'd like to thank Salaya Beach Houses for sponsoring this episode very much. Salaya, wonderful resort in um, Dumaguete in the Philippines, um, Black Sand, um, great place to visit. Um, hopefully, opening up very soon. So, DumaguetteBeachHouses.com. Um, we have been um, doing a series of um, talks, chats with eminent and all photographers over on the ADEX Pixel platform. Um, they go out on the eighth day of each month um, and typically around, the clock, around about two o'clock Singapore time, um, which is in the UK, I think it's about six or seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's fairly early. And then obviously in the US, it'll be in the middle of the night. So sorry about that. But they are available um, as records um, and um, I will add the link to the um, YouTube channel where you can see them. Um, there's lots of really fascinating chats um, and obviously we'll keep on adding those to our um, repertoire as we go along. Um, a few uh, weeks or a few months ago now, I suppose, um, we did um, a couple of episodes with um, my fellow um, contributor Alex, uh, Alex Mustard. Um, so uh, please, um, I, w w and what we did is we pre-recorded them because uh, both of us were traveling at the time and it was going to be a challenge to get together. So so we decided to pre-record them. So um, Alex entitled his talks 20 over 20 and he had to choose 20 images over 20 years of shooting. So um, it's quite an interesting talk. Um, well, it's quite interesting. It's a very interesting talk um, because it shows his progression over the years um, and it also, you know, obviously um, um, points out some of his, his classic pictures over the past 20 years. So anyway, without any further um, ado, here is Alex um, and I and our talk from edX Pixel um, in, in, earlier in the year. I'm thrilled to be joined today by my fellow photographer, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, buddy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah, excellent. Um, and um, in line with, in keeping with our theme of, of conversations with, with eminent underwater photographers, Alex has kindly prepared a retrospective um, which features an image um, from the past 20 years entitled his 2020 vision. So um, we're very fortunate to be able to scroll through a, a, effectively a back catalogue of his work for the past 20 years and see how his, um, his technique, style and um, quality has changed over the years. So um, without, with, without too much further ado, Alex, I, I'll pass it over to you to start introducing your images. Well, th thanks, Adam. Yeah, I was, um, I think the first thing I would say is that I, I wanted this to be a collection that, that leapt out to me. So I didn't spend hours and hours searching through my catalogue. I, you know, literally just, you know, put up the, the images I could find on my computer from each year and mm. picked one that, that resonated. And I think that was quite a good way mm. because it meant that actually these were the pictures that jumped out at me. Yeah. Um, so um, I think the other thing I learned was that there were definitely years where I was really on fire as a photographer. And there are some years where there's like so many pictures I'd love to have shown from. And then other years where you're like, well, actually, I did a lot of trips in that year, but maybe nothing quite that special long term came out of it. Um, so it's quite interesting um, to see that. The, the first image I'm going to show you, though, isn't from the last 20 years. It's actually it was the oldest image I could find on my computer, which is from 1993. Wow. I took my first underwater photos in 1984 when I was nine years old um, and um, in 1993, I was still at school and I took this picture here. You can see from the age of the equipment on the diver that it's not yeah. a new picture. But that's the oldest picture I could find of this Caribbean spiny lobster and a diver shot within a Konos 5, um, 15 mil lens, single flash um, type, very classic type shot of that era technically. But um, I'm going to run on now um, a little bit new into these last 20 years. So by the first of these, I was already quite a well-established underwater photographer. I'd won awards in the Antibes Festival, which was the, the biggest underwater photography festival at that time already. I was already on the committee of the British Society of Underwater Photographers. So I was pretty well established. I was writing articles and that sort of thing. So this is not a journey from the beginning of my underwater photography. It's, it's very much kind of a journey through these 20 years of working. And this first picture here is the only film picture I'm going to show, um, apart from the previous one, obviously, um, in this 20. And um, this picture here is of a, um, a frogfish in soft corals in the Red Sea. And you don't commonly see frogfish out on the, 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 the colourful reefs on the Red Sea. You tend to find them in bays and things, perhaps particularly in the more protected waters 
Um, but this one was down in the alternatives, which are some attractive reefs in south of Sinai. And the reason this picture resonates is I was on a pit trip with lots of the, the grandees of the British Society of Underwater Photographers. And I was, you know, the young kid, you know, on the trip. And so I was very keen to, to, be, to be showing my worth on this trip. So I was so happy when I found this frogfish um, and was able to show everyone on the boat this frogfish. And we spent several days diving on the same reef and we were able to see it time and again. And it was really my way of sort of saying, look, I'm not a complete waste of space on this trip. I actually, I can, you know, I, I know what my I'm own. Doing. Yeah, yeah, so I um, mm. shot with um, Nikonos RS and the 20 to 35 mil zoom lens. Mm. Um, this one. Right. Um, but by 2003, um, I was shooting digital SLRs underwater. And this picture here was, is ta taken there. And this picture here was very well, it's not a great picture, but it was very, very well known on WebPixel because yep. I used this picture to start a thread called Available Light Photos, which was the, the first discussion thread. I took this picture in June 20, 2003, and in July 2003, I, I, I immediately shared it on WebPixel and talked about this technique of being able to tune the white balance of the camera in those days, we didn't have raw converters that allowed us to change the white balance, but you mm. could change the white balance of the camera mm. and combining that with filters to be able to take colorful pictures underwater without flash. And that was incredibly groundbreaking at the time. And this was the, the first digital SLR picture done using that technique, shared on WebPixel. And that thread, you know, had, uh, I think, you know, it, it had well over 100,000 views on, on that thread. I think this is something that possibly we lose sight of now in that we all accept not just the technology of the cameras and, and the tools that we have, but also the computing tools that we have to sort of create and mm. sort of create imagery. And, you know, in actual fact, tools like Lightroom and, and Photoshop and, and being able to white balance and intellectually white balance is, is a relatively recent thing. Um, and yeah. that's sort of, I think now we just take it for granted because our, our, our mobile phone does it. But, um, but it's important to remember it wasn't always possible. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, yeah, being able to produce something like this straight out of camera mm. back then was was really, you know, really exciting mm. um, and, you know, led to several years of really intensive work, you mm. know, in, in this area of available light shooting mm. as the tools slowly got better and better. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it was um, yes, a really memorable shot from that period. And I think also, you know, because I knew I was going to show these to you, I think a real part of what WetPixel was doing in those early 2000s there was relatively few people shooting with digital underwater at that time. Mm. I know lots of people now seem to rewrite history and tell everyone they were, you know, early adopters and everything like that. But I remember I used to get so much hassle from, you know, there was, you know, every seen every week there would someone else would come onto wet pixel and slag us all off yeah. from the, you know, the old school of like, oh, these cameras will never do anything. These shots are no good um, and, and everything like that. Um, and you're all wasting your time with digital. Um, but you know, what WetPixel was amazing for us that time is we were constantly breaking down these technical barriers, mm. you know, because the gear wasn't mature like now. You mm. know, half the flash guns didn't work with half the cameras. You know, the, some cameras had pop-up flashes, some had electrical connections. They all had different protocols in them. Yeah. And there was, uh, and you know, the, the lenses, they didn't all work with all the cameras. And there was so much to learn. The housing manufacturers were having to go from having housing with one or two buttons to 30 buttons on them. Yeah. And it was just an incredible learning experience for everyone. And the WetPixel community was so exciting at that time because we were all just learning so many big things all the time. Right. I've talked far too long on that one. So on to 2004. Yeah. Um, I haven't just filled this slideshow with, you know, my well-known pictures from each year, but this is a very well-known picture. Um awarded um, as a category winner in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year that year, um, won the biggest category in the Wildlife Photographer, which is Animal Portraits, um, which gets well over 10,000 entries each year, whereas mm. the, sort of the underwater categories get you know, around about 1,000. So it's a, a much, much bigger thing to win. Um, and this picture has become you know, very well known because of that, but also it's continued to be used in retrospectives of that competition, and it's it's been in all the the books celebrating the history of that competition. So it's it's a you know it's a picture that still lives on um, for me. Um, taken with an interesting technique, I think I was really interested in that whole ability with digital to take pictures I couldn't on film. Mm. And it wasn't just about taking pictures I couldn't. It was a lot of the other serious underwater photographers out there were still shooting film at this point. Yeah. So I was take, trying to take every type of picture I could 
that I knew they couldn't to yeah. make my portfolio stand out and make my my name in underwater photography. And this picture fell into that category of shooting with a long lens underwater and adapting my technique to get a really good image quality despite shooting a relatively big subject with a relatively long lens. And I had my flash guns way out in front of my camera for this one yeah. um, to create a telephoto shot. And I think the perspective of the shot is just really unique. Mm -hmm. And while the judges of the wildlife photographer had no idea about any of that, mm -hmm. what they definitely recognized was they recognized an underwater picture with a look they hadn't seen before. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's that's a message I think anyone who's interested in competition should always take forward, yeah. is that the judges don't need to know that exactly what you've done that's clever, but they will respond if you show them something that's visually fresh and original. I think it's also got, you know, it, it, it's got this slightly, the snapper's got this slightly kind of malevolent look to it. I think it has an immediacy of of kind of connection really, which I think is really important. And I say that, I think that's largely down to where you, you being able to position yourself in the water so that it is behaving completely kind of naturally. Um, mm. and, and I think that's, that's yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a standout image for sure. Yeah. Mm, right, on to 2005 now. And this picture here, which I took for the book I was working on at the time called Art of Diving. And um, this picture here is, is the famous Janice D. Wreck in the Red Sea. And this is the picture that um, was, was I think, w was a real sort of landmark in available light shooting underwater. Um, there were some filters on the market for underwater photography, but they were all designed for the film camera e era. And also none of them could be used with a fisheye lens because they were, you know, you can't stick a big, you know, thick glass, um, glass or plastic filter. Mm on a fisheye lens. Mm. And so I wanted to make a filter that I could use with my fisheye mm. and also wanted to make one that would work with digital cameras, mm. um, specifically to take this shot. It was, um, and I, working with Peter Rowlands, we, we came up with some different formulas. And actually on the first few dives with them, I took the formula I thought would be best and gave Peter the not so good formula to test. <laughs> and his photos were better than mine. So oh, we, we oh. did so easily the formula he had um and to take these shots and it's taken with a it was taken with a sandwich of three different filters mixed together to give this really nice effect and that was quite cumbersome to use three layers of filter were quite difficult to fit on the lens so when we came back from this trip we looked at trying to get some made um so that we could have some sheets that were much more user friendly and we could only get it made in huge quantities um because the machine had to run a full run so then we decided, well, why don't we start selling this filter rather than just having it for ourselves? And and that's where Magic Filters got, was born from. Um, but it came about because I wanted to take this specific shot, which is a very classic view of this wreck, but you couldn't do this shot on film except completely in blue. And if you did it with white balance alone, you would end up with no blue water. You just have gray water in the shot as a background. So the filter allowed you to get both the color on the wreck and keep the blue of the water. And... Um, these were our dive guides on that trip, Steve and Marlin, um, who uh, um, were working in the Red Sea at that time, who um, I got to pose in this shot. So one of the few times I've actually also, um, you know, got models in this shot as well. So, mm. yeah, it's always been memorable, that one, for that reason. Mm. Yes, lovely. Okay, on to 2006. Um, and this has also got wet pixel connections because it was taken on a, a wet pixel Bahamas trip on Jim Abernathy's, um, on one of Jim and Abernathy's trips. Um, and Eric and I co-led this one um, out and we did a long, it was an extended itinerary all over the Bahamas. And on that trip, I did a lot of long exposure photography, which I'd always played with before. And in fact, some of my pictures that were awarded in the film era, era in the on-team festival were long exposure panning shots. But the reason I did it on this trip is that actually my, my Subtronic flash guns, which were notoriously unreliable, but had lovely light, got stuck only firing on full power. So I could only use them on full power. It's just quite common sort of problem for a Subtronic flash gun. And so um, um, I, I was stuck having to shoot everything on full power. So my only solution really was to do all these long exposure shots where I, I shut the aperture down, gave a massive great blast of flash and, and, and did them. So this is a, a Tiger Shark long exposure panning shot, which I really like the textures mm. and I like uh, using that technique with this slightly more unusual subject. But Eric used to always tease me, he said, this is the British technique, um, because I was always doing these long exposures, and it was, it was because of a technical issue, but it was quite fun. Right, um, 
in 2006, I also finished the photography for my book, Reefs Revealed, which was my big coral reefs book, um, which I did early on in my career, which, which was also awarded at the On Team Festival and won the, the, best, the prize there for the best photo book. And after I did that book, all my photography up to that point had been in tropical waters. And I thought, right, I've done my coral reef book. It's won the biggest award. I've won in the wildlife photographer with my coral reef pictures. It's time now as an underwater photographer to challenge myself to start diving in all the environments of the earth. And so in 2006, when I finished that photography for that book, I used some of the money I was paid for the book to buy my first dry suit and started dry suit diving and, and photography in those conditions. And one of the early trips I did diving in a dry suit was to South Australia. Um, and that in 2007, where I got this picture of leafy sea dragon. Um, and I, I really like this picture because it's, it's a, you know, it's an eye catching picture, but it was very much the style of photography I was doing at the time, you know, spending a lot of time waiting for these strong personality grabbing mm. connect, you know, um, character, revealing connective portraits, mm. shot in balanced light. I always like these pictures with blues and green backgrounds, not black backgrounds. I like this very naturalistic feel. Mm. Um, and so not only is I, I like this picture, but it does feel very consistent with the style of photography. And I remember being super happy at the time because I was one worried whether I'd be able to take my tropical photographic style into the into into cold waters. And this picture kind of proved to me that I could. Yeah, it's so, very engaging. It's really, it's very, you know, the pose and, and the eye contact is super engaging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and like the, the snapper picture I showed from a couple of years earlier, yeah. it's a picture that, you know, despite being taken on a fairly basic camera, but, you know, a fairly low megapixel digital SLR, it continues to sell and get used to this day. I think it was on, it was a magazine cover last year. Again, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, you know, these great pictures carry on and no one ever cares that they were only taken on low resolution cameras they still yeah. the lenses were good and they print up well there's a moral in that isn't there yeah absolutely. yeah so um 2008 um not i i did a lot of photography in this year but didn't have i mean i didn't have anything too amazing i think i wanted to share um but this picture here is a wide angle macro shot taken in lembe and that's a technique that's always interested me i've always really enjoyed wide angle macro and, you know, I, I remember um, it was probably a few years before this, but um, in, the, in the British diving magazines, they, they did a big feature on me. The fact that I was had this crazy idea of using a teleconverter with a fisheye and combining that with a mini dome port. And before mini domes became popular, no one had one. Yeah. And I had one. There was an old Subo one that I'd adapted. Yeah. Um, um, I had to use it on an adapter on my housing to use that mini dome. And that enabled me to take these pictures when almost no one else could and certainly no one else could using that technique a few people were doing these shots with Nikonos film cameras using teleconverters on uh, or extension tubes on the wide angle lenses but on digital you just had so much more control and you could really get that polish into the images so that was something i was playing with around this time mm. um and then into 2009 this was i think where the digital cameras started to add another feather to their bow, which was their ability to work in lower light. Yeah. And I think this fortuitously again for me really coincided with me get really getting into some of this cold water photography and suddenly environments where when you were stuck on ISO 100 or 200 film or when you were stuck with early digital cameras that were also, you know, junk above ISO 200 or 400, yeah. suddenly I was able to go into environments and shoot ISO 800, ISO 1000, which today seems quite normal, but then was, was you know, really the frontier of things using the latest cameras. Um, this was shot, I think, D3 or D, D700, I don't remember actually right now. Um, and in those environments, create space and open up space where previously you'd have been using a half second exposure. Yep. Suddenly you could shoot on a 30th, get a really sharp picture and deal with the light levels in these environments. So I really enjoyed the cold water photography in this period because we were definitely taking pictures that couldn't have been taken up to that point. Now, shots like this now, everyone's cold water pictures look like this. But at that time, it was really exciting. And I think that's something I always was very interested in 
is, you know, is taking the technology and doing something with it before anyone else could. Um, and I, I remember you were a very early adopter of Nikon Full Frame, which, which at the time was a bit of a surprise. Mm. I mean, that that shows in, I mean, allowed you presumably to get images like this that, that, that as you say, up until then have been largely impossible. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, early adopters quite generous to my, 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 my financial status. I was pretty poor. And actually, um, Craig from WetPixel lent me his D3 for the Canada trip. You know, you I've never met Craig, you know, knew him from the forums. And he lent me a D3 for a Canada trip. And Ryan lent me a housing. Um, Ryan from um, Refoto nice. Video yeah. lent me a housing for the trip to do a review. Um, but it gave me this capability when I was going there. So, yeah, it was amazing, amazing times. And, you know, you can see all those wet pixel links through that. Um, I think stylistically by this point, I was, you know, I was well established in underwater photography. And I felt it was time now to really make sure my portfolio had that professional coverage. I think early on in your career, it's important to mark yourself out by being an expert in one thing. Mm. And I, I did a lot of behavior photography early on, playing on marine biology background. I traveled regularly to the Red Sea and to the Cayman Islands. And so, you know, created really strong portfolios from there. But in the early days, I didn't try and do too much more than that. I hadn't done much shark, photog shark photography, hadn't done much big animal photography. But by 2010, I felt I really needed that professional coverage. Mm. So I started to do a lot more trips around the place to fill out my portfolio with some of the big animals, mm. knowing on a lot of these trips that I may only shoot these once in my career, but I wanted to have really strong coverage. Mm. And so I did, you know, so this is just one example, doing manatees in Florida. Um, thankfully, in the days before the very strict rules that now exist there, um, not that we would ever harass the manatees. You don't get good pictures by harassing manatees. Um, well, I mean, yeah. And it was it was nice to be able to go there early in the morning, use a bit of flash. This picture's got a tickler flash on it, which just lifts the detail on it. Being able to be inside the springs in the clear water, um, you know, and uh, you know, some of those things are still possible, but I think things have changed there. And it was yeah, really really enjoyable times um, going there in those those days. Um, 2011 always reminds me it was the year that I was working on a big UK conservation photography project. So after years of shooting all around the world, I actually spent most of this time shooting in the UK, which was slightly inconvenient because I just moved away from the UK to live in Italy. So I was living in Italy at this time, but got a big UK. So it was an overseas trip, um, mm -hmm. overseas um, photography coming to the UK and shooting a variety of underwater life um, for that, that big project there. And so th this year, I had to pick something from that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, inspiration and um, wonderful imagery. Um, and um, I, I'm pleased to report that um, that's not all we're going to see of Alex's wonderful work. Um, we have um, the second, the, the next instalment coming soon. So please check back for um, Alex's um, 2020, um, the, the later years, perhaps we could call it that. Thanks very much, Alex. We'll see you soon. Thanks. To um, Alex Pixel Platform for um, hosting us um, and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you on the 8th week's month over there on um, on the Alex Pixel Platform. Um, please um, thanks again to Salaya Beach Houses for sponsoring us throughout we, this, this episode. We're very, very um, grateful for their support um, and thank you to, to you all for watching. Please feel free to add any comments or suggestions in the comments box as always um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>